So I think this panel discussion is uh, titled about, about the TSM implementation, but uh, we, we can make this more general. So we can talk about any INET topic or INET topic anybody wants to bring up. But other than that, I see a lot of TSM stuff on this summit. So it really seems to be a hot topic. And yeah, well, that's why I guess this is titled as that. So we are open to discussion for any questions. If you have, I, I don't know what how, how to start. If anybody has any idea, <laughs> don't hesitate. I think the biggest concern regarding TSNIC is that there are many projects popping up here and there, and it's there using different frameworks for to, to be based on, and they're not compatible compatible with each other. So it's uh, it's always a problem. It's not to say that INET is kind of have uh, has TSN support, but actually does not because it's not really. And there are many issues. Yes, uh, so so I'm very happy with the TSN stuff as is added to INET. I hope we are working and, on and, together. And yeah, and then also uh, the the the, uh, the the implementation, this modular implementation is. I, th I think it's it's very helpful to to use, and it will also. Yeah. Uh, One thing I really liked, by the way, is I don't know if you. Uh, listened to the age uh, conversation about the uh, yes. hierarchy token bucket. Yes. Because it's, this is, for example, very nice and fits into the this framework. I mean, it's not it's not like it's, it's not as not a TSN standard, but you could easily use this as a shaper, for example, to compare against two or just combine the other shapers. And it's very easy to actually I ask them to to integrate this into INET because it's just a very few models it's nice to yes create something it would be nice to for users to let it use it out of the box and then i had no i, I haven't had the chance to talk to i don't know so who is this but uh I think it's the only duty work and one is he, he was I got the information that he he's working on some clocks and some more realistic clock devices. Um, that would be also nice because yes, we have clocks and we have all kinds of uh, simplistic everything mm -hmm. oscillators, but it would be nice to have a real much better. Yes, I, I talked to him in uh, in one of the hackathon sessions, and mm -hmm. he said he can't be here because uh, he's working. He took he took one leave one day of leave from from work to 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 participate in one day, and he said that he worked he worked on these these topics previously, and uh, now he has a little bit more time to to come back to these projects and stuff like that. So okay. one thing he he did is is uh, he has a very detailed, uh, very realistic uh, clock noise model based on some publications with re on, based on on real world measurements on, on various clocks. So it's, it's kind of kind of realistic. Can you expand on that? What what is a clock noise? Because I <laughs> to me it's well, okay. Let the, the clock speed actually fluctuates. So ah. you have that that's that, so it's it's a kind of noise on the on the normal operation of the clock. And it comes from thermal thermal fluctuations, and I don't know all sorts okay. of stuff. And yeah, and uh, he said he he packaged this this code as a as a library, which is independent from Omnet or any kind of framework. It's called lib libpln. It's on on GitHub. So it would be possible to to use that one, and. Uh, Another thing he, his, he he wrote is a PTP protocol uh, for time, time synchronization, and he explained to me that the PTP protocol is uh, came first, and it was it, it's a time synchronization protocol which contains 
uh, a number of profiles for various uses. And uh, GPTP came about by taking PTP and implementing one, one specific profile in it. And also lots of stuff additionally later on, but it's basically one profile from PTP. And uh, he, so he also has a PTP simulation model for, for Omnet. And we were also wondering whether it makes sense to, to include PTP in the INET framework. Uh, I would think so. I, I don't, I don't really know. I have no, I can't really, I don't really have an, an opinion on this because I can make an informed opinion. So it is, so no one knows like in which direction the world is going. So it is, it is possible that uh, GTP, GPTP is going to completely like take over for the existing uses of, of PTP. So, P, so it might be that PTP is on the way of becoming a, a an obsolete protocol, but I don't know. I don't work in this in this field. So, if PTP has a future, then it it certainly makes sense to put it into INET. But mm -hmm. if it's something legacy, then I don't think it's I that know. would make so much sense. So I don't know. <laughs> Maybe some uh, more information. By any case, I would say that uh, uh, INET should be. I mean, if you just think about the clocks and the time synchronization, should be supporting clocks and time synchronization out of the box. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the researchers and then yeah. the, in the industry needs it. But, so you, you shouldn't need another library for that. Yeah. That doesn't make sense because it's so basic functionality. In any time since the networking, it's so basic to have clocks and time synchronization. It should be. Yeah. yeah. We could, we, could, we could try having a look at, at the PTP code base. It, it's probably a completely different code base from GPTP, but, but it's like, sort of I don't know. GPTP who, who knows, maybe. Not, not such a big, I mean, it's not, it's no? just three or five files or two, two, two modules or something. But it's also not very complete, I heard, no? Uh, it, well, it, there are many features in the standard, which is not implemented, that's clear. Okay. But, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, but well, that one thing that we probably should need to include in INET is this this lip ELN with the with the clock noise realistic. Yeah, I just look at it and yeah, okay. See, yeah. but uh, we would have to talk to him. How do we include such a project? Um, one one question maybe. Uh, so I, I was wondering if, if uh, yeah, <laughs> I right. So the the um, you plan to include then? The, so will the TSN features be included in the next release of INET, or they are already in the current release? Because I don't I don't remember. No, they are not included in the current release. In the next release, in four or four. So you you're you're planning to 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 release this any 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 time soon or? Um... I think yes, in in a, in a few months. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Uh, maybe okay. I, I, I don't know, but uh, we are quite close to because uh, because all these examples are working. This is a uh, yeah, I think so. uh, because I, I think it you, you know it, it it is good for um, uh, researchers. It will be good to have uh, you know these basic implementations. Also, uh, sort of as guidelines, right? You said, yeah, maybe you don't have the full implementation and all the features of TSN, but at least some yeah, of them as a start as a starting point, right? Because then uh, every researcher is working on something very specific, right? And um, and then they can start from what is there and then extend it rather than starting from scratch with the, uh, and, and nothing is compatible with anything and you know uh, everything becomes a mess. So uh, of course, th this is really, really helpful and that's, that's a big, big thank you, of course. Um, but what, one question is uh, uh, related to the documentation. So you also plan to document some few examples uh, regarding how to use, how to enable the different options sure i mean all the examples I, i've just shown to you i guess those will be turned into a showcase with, with full documentation and also the net files or the modules which are used there should be documented okay, uh, okay. plus i guess there would be a chapter in the user guide related to time system networking because otherwise how, how would you yeah, yeah exactly 
So having having a chapter in the manual or in the user guide would be really great because then, then, then it's just easy to go there and, and look yeah. at those. It's just focus on which modules are related to which DSM features and how to use them, basically. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, really. This is really great. I have a question also regarding the, the next uh, CSN implementation in INET. Um, we were recently looking at uh, the other frameworks that also implement the CSN standards. Uh, I think one is nesting, the other one was core for INET. How does it uh, compare to those uh, function-wise? I know that I think the, the current INET uh, plans are to input slightly more standards than the other ones included. But uh, do you know roughly how it compares? I would say that uh, many function, I mean, most of the functionality in the core for INET is uh, replicated because you have to do mm -hmm. this for uh, for a partner, let's say, and then um, I, I don't know much about nesting in, in that sense, uh, but it's uh, architecture wise, it's quite different because mm -hmm. we are focusing on having lots of small modules which you can combine in very various ways. And uh, you also keep in mind that this uh, implementation should not only be standard. Mm -hmm. And so, so to say, to, so, so it shouldn't just implement implement certain standard features. It should also allow users to experiment and research in new directions. And so that's um, that's an important part here. Point here. So it's kind of yeah. That's I, yeah. I, I could also say that the core for our core for INET is born out of uh, time to trigger at Ethernet. And we had the, we had then added uh, AVB stuff and then added TSN stuff mm -hmm. and all this time triggered Ethernet and AVB stuff is of mostly obsolete now and, mm -hmm. and and people are, are focusing on TSN so I think uh, the the INET stuff is, is is more focused on TSN and not such as experimental at core for INET mm -hmm. is for uh, for for different. Uh, real-time Ethernet protocols. So it's uh, it's it's more streamlined. Mm -hmm. We, we focus more on nesting, to be honest, because yeah. uh, we want to do sort of a digital twin of what uh, one of the test tests that we have. And uh, yeah, I, I really am happy that uh, INET will also include those features because this seems to be in a much better state to, to work with, let's say, than the proprietary ones. But thank you. And as usual, we are very open to suggestions or, I mean, yeah, it's not yet released, so it's not that really visible for users. But in any case, I mean, it's, uh, it's always, it always seems like that we are trying to, I mean, just push <laughs> uh, new architectures and modules on users and there's very little feedback, which we are we are actually very open to receive. Mm -hmm. So it would be always nice. It's not just uh, sending pull requests or sending, uh, I don't know, bug reports. You could, I mean, I read the answer for for questions which I get directly to my email address because those are most of the students asking them how to do their homework or something like that. But if any of you guys are, I mean, I mean if researchers, if, if you could uh, uh, talk about interesting changes or something, it's, we, are, we are very open to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one thing is that we have a, a separate Google room for TSN discussion. Yes. So if somebody plans to take a look, work, or give suggestions, then definitely contact us and we will add it to the room. So, so there is a full lot of people there that could discuss TSN. Lots of discussion in the past, and you can also read that, that part. So. Yeah. Yeah, and I think one of the good things of the COVID was that it lowered the bar for everyone for video conferencing. So like everybody <laughs> seems like is much more willing to go <laughs> in a video session. And uh, in in the last like one two years, we also also had many and had many many video calls with with various members of the community. For example, Philip and and others and Ion and, and Christoph Zimmer and others. So if you um, if you feel like you have an idea which would be like easier to discuss a question, yeah, I think it's just 
it's just easier to to have a, a video call now speaking of that we can switch to edward's question because he i don't know hi he said he's interested in getting rid of net filter hooks well uh, i mean i i i think we had a discussion on the google group about it maybe a while back um and i'm kind of i i kind of agree that they're not the best way of doing things and uh it'd be good to get rid of them but ultimately lots of modules like dymo adv um some other implementations rely on those hooks for things like ipv4 ipv6 you know how how would they actually get broken up into modules with message gates you mm -hmm. know is it a plausible i think it's a plausible we have this in mind yeah actually, we just don't have enough time for people well that's what <laughs> i mean but is it plausible like you know is there enough time for people to actually do it you know sure it's, it's always technically possible but is it plausible yeah. i think it's plausible uh, I think it's uh, uh, at one point, uh, Zoli, Zoli, my colleague almost started working on it. But I think it's uh, just splitting up IPv4 in a way that uh, gets rid of filter hoops, but you split it up into multiple modules so that you can basically compose them back together to get something similar to what what to how the hooks are positioned in, into the into the IP layer is fairly. Easy, I would say. And do you think it would be possible to have um, sort of two? Uh, how do I say this? Two different implementations. No, not to have two different implementations. Have one implementation of submodules, and then encapsulate it in two ways. Encapsulate it in a way which works for reconnection, and encapsulate it in a way which still works for the old uh, net filter hooks as a sort of go between to bridge that gap. I think it would be possible. It would absolutely be possible. I'm not sure if I mean are you saying that uh, having lots of uh, and lots lots of uh, having these smaller modules and combining them together, which is still compatible with the with the filter and the filter hooks? Is that what you're asking? That's... Yeah, like could you because obviously the IPv4 module is I'm just thinking of that example. First, I would just keep the old one too. I mean it's uh... Yeah, I mean, I'm kind of, I'm, I'd be worried about that because then you might have diverging implementations or diverging bug fixes. You might have bugs in one version that aren't in the other. It's not like we are doing too many bug fixes in IP before in the past not, no, one no. year or two years. Yeah. It's like okay. so. Yes, what you say say is reasonable, but it's very unlikely to. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, I think that was about all, really, unless there are other. Uh, questions about it. But you could do it in a way that uh, basically when you combine the smaller modules, you could have a module which acts like a hook. Yeah, I, I think that's what I'm Something and then, then all the protocols would work on that. But then you have the chance to do something else. Because if you combine them in a different way or you put classifiers there or whatever you want, then you have a different way of organizing your yeah. architecture. And the, the in the combination of all of them that still implements the hooks would allow for the other AODV modules to be converted more slowly. So they still work with the old and then you can convert them slowly to work with the new version too. Mm -hmm. yeah, and one task that still awaits us is to do the same kind of refactoring on IPv6 because it's got also not quite quite some functionality in some modules which are do not combine probably in the in the optimal way not okay. configurable in the optimal way so that's that's going to undergo some overhaul as well sometime okay. in the future yeah yeah what about mobile ipv6 because i don't really know where that stands yeah we do have something for mobile ipv6 i'm always very confused and i look at it i'm like it doesn't really fit yeah, the other IPv6 modules. Is it the sort of thing where how how extend how much of an extension is it of IPv6, and how different completely? Is I always it? felt like it's more like hammered in, into it. <laughs> so it came and just hit it. Well, <laughs> I think uh, original well, his, historically, the the IPv6 module in in INET was created with the purpose of of studying mobile IPv6. So that was in the um, in in 
four, five, six, something mm -hmm. like that. And, uh, and the mobile IPv6 research was kind of hot topic at, the, at that time. Now it's died off because probably they run out of topics to research. <laughs> But it, it, it was quite a hot topic then. So there was one guy implementing the IPv6 module, and there was there was another guy adding mobile IPv6. Uh, it was he was from Germany. I forgot his name. Anyway, so it, so the so the IPv6 and mobile IPv6 were added by two different people. Yeah. But to be honest, we didn't studied that much the IPv6 or mobile IPv6 part. So. so yeah, I'm just thinking it's not necessarily possible to get rid of one and make yeah or, or merge them, make one, make them one. But I guess they're quite different implementations. So that would be very difficult. Um, I think they could be made as 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 a collection of small components that work together, like like to use term. so that I think that's that's possible to improve. Mm, as in by like refactoring out the common parts. Yeah. Well, they both implement these common parts. Yeah. And then getting it down to boiling it down to such a point where there's only one or two parts different because one is mobile and one is not. Yeah. Well. well actually, okay. I didn't say that. Okay. Mobile IPv6 actually builds on the plane IPv6. Yeah, I think it has. Some it's built on top, built on top of it, so it doesn't replicate yeah. the the basic IPv6 functionality. Yeah. Okay. So it's already sort of like that, but. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we just have another topic that uh, uh, Philip Meyer's team, they, uh, they study uh, um, software defined networking and open flow, the open flow model is quite uh, um, an important part of that, that picture, that puzzle. And I remember that uh, other other project, other, other people were also interested in, in OpenFlow. And uh, I was just wondering that given that the OpenFlow model uh, doesn't have an active, uh, so the original author is not active anymore. It's uh, the OpenFlow project. It's, it is from time to time, someone takes the effort to port it to the next version of Omnet or INET and stuff like that, but it doesn't have like an active maintainer. I, I, I was just wondering that uh, if it's, if that would be justified to merge it into INET, because that would, that would sort of ensure that it's uh, always, always like up to date because it's included, it, it, then it needs to be to build, to compile at least. It needs to pass the fingerprint tests and so on. So perhaps this this is a place where we could we could it's a time and we could we could discuss whether op OpenFlow should have a place in INET or should it be kept as a separate project. Oh, man. But I, I guess it, it depends on the size, probably, because that's that's the only uh, possible drawback. So how much it does increase the, the already large code base? <laughs> how many how many new symbols? Yeah, Windows will not be able yeah. to put together. <laughs> well, the log past that time, I mean. <laughs> there was an additional suggestion, by the way, to also integrate uh, the OS3 uh, satellite mobility model uh, into INET. That was also a suggestion. It was also ported to INET 4 and a bit of cleaned up. So regarding, regarding OpenFlow, like, Philip, what do you think about this? <laughs> uh, I think it would be nice, but so, so if I would de could decide it, I would say yes, but um, <laughs> it, it, I, I don't have have the, the, the work with it uh, over the next years and so, uh, so that's 
I think that that you guys <laughs> have to decide if it's if it's uh, reasonable and and I think it depends on other people if other people also are dependent on this open flow or are interested in the open flow. If it's just me or, or just my or just Timo, then well, software defined networking as an idea is generally on the rise. Am, am I right? Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, I, I would say yes. And, 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 yes. Or was it just a passing fad? Probably not. Or no, I, I, I no, think I, I, it's, it's, I would it's, say yeah. Yeah, sorry. No, no, go on, go on. So, so I'm aware of, aware of that. It's that's a hot topic in 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 vehicle networks and also industry networks. And it, it's also currently. Uh, uh, also part of TSN standards, some kind of controller, the SDN controllers using NetCon. Exactly. So the, the, the gate scheduling configuration part in the beginning uh, is included in the standard as as, as uh, option, right? To use SDN to configure the, the schedules and use some some. Um, so it's definitely interesting from the for the in vehicle communication use case, but but I think the SDN idea in general is interesting in general for whoever is doing uh, wireless networks, mobile networks, or or any other stuff. Yeah. Probably probably in five G as well. I don't know the, the the five G guys are here as well. They could confirm if if this is true. Yeah, because. I think from the network management point of view, it provides like clear advantages that you have a central configuration server and then you can reconfigure the whole network at once using an atomic transaction. This looks quite attractive. At least it's much more preferable than having like random control plane protocols for each part, each layer, each part of each, each protocol inside various routers and switches. That, that, that sounds more cumbersome. So I would I would imagine that this idea would gain more 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 mind share and it would would continue to to gain ground. I, I think I have also to speak to Timo what, what what's his opinion on this because uh, for this SDN controller stuff using also TSN features you also have to have to use netcon and ju not just openflow and th this he have implemented netconf in this sdn for core framework he has added and it maybe a conjunction of this two would be the sdn controller stuff people would want in in, in inet to not just uh, support the openflow protocol but also netcon I don't know if, if there's any you know, netconf things in INET, in the newest INET, but I, I'm mm. not aware of it. No, but Attila had some passing project in the past that had to do with netconf, I think. Attila, are you here? Yes, yes, I did. And um, that's netconf and, and the young uh, project was uh, basically a um, Converter slash generator that took uh, an instance model of of a first of an Ethernet traffic generator and then of a network architecture and then uh, generated an INET simulation from that that corresponds to the configuration in the young model, but that was mostly an external tool that that generated a configuration for the simulations, like the uh, net files for the architecture and, and the ini files for the traffic generator configuration. So directly in INET, there mm -hmm. is no really support for NetCon for Young or anything like that. Yeah. It's as a first step that that could be done anyway is to uh, to look at that uh, port, port of open flow to to inet 4 which which 
which which you found yesterday, and to ha to have a look whether whether it's whether it's good or not, and and if if it's yeah, if it's good, then we could we could make make it um, some kind of official open flow release, and then keep in mind that that we might might want to integrate it into INET. If I can give my, my two cents here, uh, re regarding the general topic of uh, SDN, uh, I'm, I'm second the, what Philip said about uh, uh, basically SDN not being only open flow. It has, be, has become a, a larger concept, uh, which started, of course, uh, with open, open flow, but is now covering a lot of more aspects. Uh, just to, see, to mention one, uh, BG, BGP, the BGP protocol is being a lot used uh, as part of the STN paradigm, uh, extension of BGP and stuff like that. Um, the main thing that is, I, I believe is on the rise right now about SDN is the, the P4, uh, P4 protocol, uh, which is kind of uh, uh, not really as an extension of open flow, but an extension of the concept of open flow. Uh, the way they, they explain it is that you can define a router speaking open flow uh, written in P4. This is the way they kind of uh, discuss about that. Uh, and this is one, one part. So there is definitely interest in, in research, but a lot of in, in industry about uh, the SDN concept in general. My second opinion in here, in here is that uh, there is a lot of, uh, um, how can I say, it's hard to, to get into, um, to provide, to, to fight against the, the existing tools for testing SDN and open flow stuff, because being uh, by default, uh, by definition, a software based uh, thing, there is a lot of uh, testing objects that are available. There is a lot of uh, uh, tools based on Mininet that are available. So I, uh, for what I see, most of the researchers are mostly using uh, uh, either Mininet, uh, which is kind of, it is an emulator rather than, uh, than, uh, than a simulator. And they can use directly into that uh, real implementation of OpenFlow, for, for example. So maybe in that case, uh, this is my opinion, of course, I would see more interesting uh, something like uh, uh, cross simulation approaches or co-simulation approaches, including Mininet and, uh, and Omnet. Uh, but again, this is this is my just my my view on this. I don't know if there are any project on P four uh, uh, currently on Omnet. I I haven't seen any. Yeah, Mininet is a diff certainly interesting data point here that I wasn't aware of. Yeah, if you look there, there is a, a, a lot of uh, tools based on, on Mininet uh, uh, and extension of Mininet. Even I, I believe there is also uh, something called Mininet Wi-Fi, which includes uh, both uh, 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 so the typical software switches and uh, Wi-Fi nodes. And all of these is basically uh, emulated, uh, I believe through container, if I recall correctly. Mm -hmm. Okay, I just opened the website. It says, Minute creates a realistic virtual network running real kernel switch and application code on a single machine in seconds with a single command. Uh, so this sounds like if we have like this hardware in the loop examples, then this could we, we, this could be like a, a useful useful tool. There, does some someone else have uh, uh, experience with Mininet? Uh, 
the team was also using Mininet of yeah. for, for 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 this SDN stuff because yeah you just just could add the real uh, virtual switch implementations, mm -hmm. the real one and and and. and But, but but I am personally have never never used it, but but I I'm aware the team was often using it. Yeah. The 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 other tool that is uh, widely used, but I, I believe you are aware of this, Andras, is GNS3. Uh, but in that case is uh, that was uh, mostly used for uh, emulating uh, Cisco routers, uh, uh, Juniper routers, uh, stuff like that. And I know that SDN is also being emulated on GNS3, but I believe that. Uh, Uh, the philosophy that's behind Mininet uh, makes it a lot more, you know, a lot easier to be used in this context. Mm -hmm. Yes, we are we are aware of uh, GNS3 and, and the various Cisco. Uh, Emulation tools like okay, Vladimir Vesely and yeah and Jan, they have presented about it. So but it, it just looks like it, it would, would make sense to to somehow make it easier to have interoperability between like Omnet and Mininet, right? Some some e e easy to set up sort of configuration. I definitely agree. So if, if, if there is interest, I think we would, we would be happy to work together with someone who has a uh, like day-to-day -day experience with Mininet and, uh, and would know how to What are, what are, what would be the good ways to proceed? Personally, I use that for mostly for teaching rather than that for than for research. But uh, mm -hmm. if, if we see that is uh, there is interest in in this, uh, I would be more than happy to discuss about that. Mm -hmm. Even, even because I, I also use Omnet for teaching, so it, uh, it is a win-win situation in my case. any other topic yeah either inet or omnet or whichever with inet there was this topic i'm i'm not sure whether i should bring it up but anyway <laughs> so we were we were internally we were a little bit discussing about like splitting inet into two parts One would be a core library for uh, generic network simulation, which would contain the infrastructure, sort of in architectural and infrastructure support for creating various and no uh, protocol simulations. And the other one, the other part would, would build on top of this, of this uh, core, and that would contain the actual protocols. Because, uh, Okay, INET is like, okay, foundationally, it's like TCP, IP and stuff like that. But the, it's, got, it's got a lot, lot of components which would be useful even when using a completely different protocol stack, for example, RENA or whatever else. And the, these things include the, basically the, 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 the packet structure, the headers, packet headers and then manipulating packets and packet tags and of course and then 
like visualization components, like drawing various annotations and arrows and everything, or support for uh, node locations and mobility, or basically support for wireless communications. I mean, the physical layers like modeling the medium and modeling uh, radio signal propagation and, and interference and stuff like that, because- but not, the, not the technology specifics. Not, the, not the technology, not the yes. Yes, but the, the, the physical physical parts, which which are independent of technology, because they, they could be useful for basically any kind of protocol, any kind of protocol stack. And of course, this approach has advantages and disadvantages as well. <laughs> so the obvious advantage would be that someone who who wants to experiment with kind of with a completely new protocol stack or with an abstract protocol stack, like for teaching purposes, for example, or to have uh, to, just to experiment with various ideas, they wouldn't wouldn't get the the, the baggage of the whole of the whole INET with all, all the, the thousand protocols, and uh, and potentially this core library, the API of this core library could be a lot more stable than the protocols themselves could be kept a, a, a lot more stable so i think that, that there are so these these that i would cons consider the advantages and then uh, disadvantages of course that uh, at the moment someone who wants to simulate computer network they have to download only one library inet and that and that that's it and but if we split it up, then they will have to download two libraries, the core library plus the protocols, and they would have to download. Like there's lots of um, nuances, nuances that associated with. Them. They have to download like two compat compatible versions of these two libraries, and then of course it's a little bit more cumbersome to build those libraries separately and to ensure that like how to start simulations and stuff like that. So it's yeah it's uh, certainly more cumbersome than having everything in one single project so there are upsides and downsides as well and we are quite yeah well, yeah technically this is a distribution question so we could create some kind of distributions which would make this easier for the user but it's definitely a bit more complicated than just having a single shared library where, uh, which you have to link again so yeah it, it would be somewhat more complicated i mean my personal opinion from being a relative newcomer is that having it all in one place is quite easy and just having one library even though the library you know perhaps it's a bit bloated with lots of protocols that you don't need. I don't think that's too much of an issue because it's still performant, basically. Well, yeah, uh, there are some problems, for example, on Windows, where you have a big library with long, 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 long linking times. So uh, it may have its advantages and disadvantages. <laughs> The question really is that, uh, and the other idea is that uh, we as a core developers have expertise in software architecture and not so much in, in protocol design and protocol knowledge. And in that way, we could somehow factor out the, uh, let's say those parts, what we could fully su support and those parts where we definitely need external people who are, I mean, no, more knowledgeable about the actual protocols. So it's a kind of separating the, the code base into two clearly separate uh, part with a well-defined interface. So, um, that that was the idea and and the fact whether this is a single dll or two dls linked together this is much more technical so for example you could see something like 
well it's 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 really something like we could leave everything just like this but just add the comment in certain files that this is part of the core inet library and this is part of the protocol inet library that's the it's just informal then we could create two separate source uh, folders in inet and still build a single uh, inet dll but say that whichever is inside this source folder it's considered to be uh, the part of the core or infrastructure library and stuff and then we can also build two separate dls or uh, but uh, one of them but we still could have everything in the single repository then mm -hmm. we could do something like two repository and the inet protocol one would use the the other one as a sub module so there are several approaches we can we can try it's just really uh, the thing that what kind of benefit you see yeah. in in having only a, it's not really the bloated one it's more something like uh, the if we could have the infrastructure separately then we could probably keep the api more stable uh, and that would mean that certain projects would be I mean, it would be much easier to keep them up to date with newer versions, because if you see Omnet, for example, it's relatively easy to keep uh, projects between minor Omnet versions up to date, because we are trying to keep the API backward compatible. We could not do that with the INET, with the whole INET project, it's just it was just not possible, not feasible, but we might be able to do that for the for the base architecture. That's that's the, so technically this could be still a single DLL or a single download or whatever. It's more like from the point of management. Yeah. On a related note. Uh, INET is not, not a single monolithic project because we, we have these project features that we have introduced quite a few years ago, which means that you can, you can disable parts of the code base. Actually, if you turn off all features, then I think it only the, mostly all the infrastructure remains. And I, I'm actually, uh, I've, in some, some presentations, we've seen uh, people compile INET and, and waiting for, for linking, to, which, which would take a very long time. And so I got, and this actually li compilation linking times could be cut by turning off the features you don't need. So in most, most simulations that you run, you don't need all the protocols in INET. You have, I don't know, lots of protocols that are, are irrelevant to, the, to, the, to your simulation. And it would, and if you want to spare on compilation times and then link, linking times, you could turn off these features. And I, I was actually, I was just wondering how many people actually routinely use these protocol features in INET. Maybe, could we maybe do a little voting in, in these reactions? You have, a, I don't know, a, a, this green yes tick mark no. which saying yes, yes and no. So do you, yes. do you use? <laughs> Do, do you use uh, the INET project features to cut down size? And speed up compilation. Yeah. What also if you have if you are not using it, you just use the. I have no idea. Where do you see the sum summary of the result? Uh, at the bottom of the of the participants window, you can see 10, um, 10, 10 yes, nine no. Last one. Eight, eight no. Eight nine eight nine. Yeah, whatever. 
someone went to to get a coffee. So um, yeah, so I, so I, I have a follow up question if that's okay for voting anyway. <laughs> okay, I would be very curious. I mean, you're all pros. Uh, who's using Windows? Because I have this gripe for a while. Uh, is there anybody who who uses Windows <laughs> in in development? We might need to wait for the last vote to clear before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah I would say it's 50 50 percent, right? Yeah, now. but let's let's make a vote on this as well. Then, then we'll yeah. see. Yeah. Okay, please. then remove your votes and then what? Who is using Windows for development? Yeah, I'm still on coffee though. <laughs> I think what rather <laughs> note about the linking time is uh, relevant. I think as well, I see a lot of projects where people build their own protocols within the INET project instead of inheriting from it. And I yeah, see that, that a lot. Windows has um, a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, a relation mm -hmm. to that as well because it's slower. Yes, but this is an easy to work around problem. And what everybody is saying that you shouldn't implement your project inside INET. That's yeah, every, every time you make a change to your project, you shouldn't have to recompile INET. You should yeah. just be using a reference to the DLL and then... Yeah. Uh, so you know, so should, perhaps that's something that's missing in the sort of introduction on the Windows side of it is that, yeah. well, but maybe on all sides of it, of just how to structure your mm -hmm. software project. Um, but oh, I think a lot of people don't come from a software background, mm -hmm. so it's new to them. Yeah, something I'm experimenting with actually is the Windows subsystem for Linux. And in later preview versions of, the window, of, of Windows, they have also... Uh, graphical support so gui and it looks like uh, with those with that approach it's quite easy to actually install an ubuntu uh, version of omnet in windows and it just works seemingly exactly the same who, who you would see uh, the mingv console works so you have a console you can start stuff there you can do things there, you can run grep and whatever Linux command you want. And then when you start a graphical program, it just starts on Windows and you can interact with that. So I'm wondering that maybe on the long term. Uh, ah, Rudy, just one thing, the, the, the point in the whole thing is that you get the speed up associated with working yeah. on a Linux system while using a Windows machine. Yeah. So that's yeah. the point of the whole thing. Yeah, actually, yes. Uh, I would say that uh, with the latest Omnet 5.7, we have a preview of that. And also with the Omnet 6, uh, we have changed the tool chains. And because of that, we can use LLD and stuff like that. So uh, the linking time on Windows is, is, is much, much faster than the uh, latest 5.6 Omnet. But uh, even in that case, still the compilation and stuff and writing files and stuff like that, it's just much slower on Windows. So, uh, and uh, as far as I see the testing in the Windows subsystem for Linux images, it's just almost the same like in native, uh, native Linux. So, uh, so I think we should ask the question of the Windows. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah that are you? Do you think that you would use the Windows subsystem? I mean, the Windows users could could mm -hmm. react. Do you I, think, I, do you see, are would... you seeing yourself using the Windows sub, uh, or the Linux subsystem? Uh, it's, it's, my, it's, it's, it's the best feature of Windows is the Windows subsystem for Linux. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, That's and, the and, and I have also planned if they release this VSLG, the first thing I would would, would try is, is to run on it in it. Ah, so uh, I'm. I'm. Uh, this, this would be very. I'm. I'm just asking this because, yeah, probably for Omnet six, we will still keep the MinGV uh, implementation and stuff like that. But uh, if there is a need, then I oh, would. Answers are yes. Yeah, I, I would say that I would put some effort into creating some installation instructions or downloadable VSLG image uh, or whatever and see how that works and maybe publish that also as a 
possible distribution or whatever distribution method or uh, and we will see how that works on long term probably when everybody has access to vslg then probably that could work yeah. even as a so the windows uh, the native windows version would be a kind of legacy where yes. you know, what you could use if you really 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 want to but for the most of the users i would say that we could try this to 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 push them towards using the the and uh, there would be an additional advantage because if we can distribute uh, VSL images, then that would mean that we can also distribute prebuilt binaries in that. So users even didn't have to, to configure and build and whatever the Omnet. So you would just press the button and you would get a terminal where you can immediately start Omnet and the simulations and stuff like that. You it's, even don't need the terminal because you can also host these, these icons directly in Windows versus VSLG so that you, a normal user, just double click a, a, a yeah, icon sure. on Windows and, and the yeah, sure. yeah. yeah, the ID the ID could be started also with yeah. a single, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's very, it's an, a, a, a very normal user don't don't even know about what, what's in the background. So it's yeah, sure. I think it's, it would be a very nice solution for for Windows users, mm -hmm. and also would save work for for many framework developers because they don't have to build native Windows. Yes, yeah, something like that. And <clears throat> also, I'm thinking about how this could be uh, somehow combined with some kind of uh, container technologies like docker or or whatever so that we could even probably create some kind of binary distributions for the models i'm not sure on this something like docker volumes or whatever it would be kind of great to have some description and then that just you would execute on the user machine and everything would be downloaded binarily. Uh, the exact version, which was described with the, with the actual receipt that, that was used, it, it would be great. I'm not sure on this, how this should be done. But as a first step, I would say that this VSLG stuff should be explored. To be fair, we have a, a similar, uh, should say uh intention with mac os as well because there you have the problem of permission hell <coughs> doing whenever you try to do something they didn't think of uh on your own machine so container-based distribution on mac os is also something that might work out well yeah regarding for example there was no question but uh yeah we have a new processor architecture on on mac and right now we still don't have arm based binaries for omnet i mean from the id because of well i still don't have access to proper arm based eclipse and arm based uh, java runtime so right now the uh, if you want to run natively on arm then you have to actually use, I have created a, an ARM-based Linux uh, distribution also for the Omnet 6, the, the latest Omnet 6 version. So <laughs> uh, the fastest way to run Omnet uh, on Mac OS ARM machines is right now to run uh, the Linux ARM version in a uh, Docker image. <laughs> in emulation so yeah we will explore also some container based distribution method but first i would say we should try and push the vsl version because that's the bigger problem so uh, uh, 
anyone who is using Omnet in, uh, yeah, in teaching, Antonio or anyone, do you use uh, Windows or Linux machines for those? I use uh, in a Mac machine right now. Uh, mm -hmm. but I uh, but the, I did that in the last two years. Before I I used to use only uh, Linux based. Yeah, uh, not really. I, I'm not really interested in what you are using personally. But if students need to use Omnet, then that's I guess. Those are not Mac machines. Okay, yes, uh, I will get into that point. I tend to use a kind of uh, Darwinian approach. I just throw the link. <laughs> okay. They are master students, so they need to understand how to install something. So they... <laughs> uh, <and then coughs> the, I, I learned how to install uh, uh, Omnet on uh, on uh, on Mac at the, at the time it was uh, not really uh, simple from a student who just mm -hmm. uh, went trial and error for like two days and was able to, to make this installation. But I know that they are kind of seamlessly using that on uh, either on uh, Windows and the, that was the main option uh, in the first like four years ago. On Linux, at least, uh, I'm not, sorry, in, uh, in uh, Windows four years ago. Right now, they are mostly installing that on uh, virtual machines. Uh -huh. But just because the the tools uh, that they use, are, which are uh, revolving around Omnet, are Linux based. Just yeah, yeah. But then practically, the Windows subsystem for Linux is practically yes, it's a virtual machine. Yeah, built into the so so we can expect that soon more and more people will start to use this also because we, I, we currently use just uh plain windows though um we teach a module for master students mm -hmm. um and we just have it installed on all the machines uh, in the university or if not installed already then like one button automatically extracts it into the applications. Um, and from experience, the ones that don't do it on the university machines, when they install it on their own machines, they've mostly got Windows mm -hmm. laptops anyway, and they prefer to use the Windows version out of the box, mm -hmm. so. So the question is when Windows subsystem for this VSL G version will be available for all Windows versions, I mean, Windows 10 and 11. So it's it's more something like related to the uh, release of the of that subsystem to to the general public. I think it will be out this year, and the question is when will users update? Yeah, I, I also think it, it would be part of the the, the fall update. Yeah, I, I believe it's a separate. So it's not not part of the Windows image. It's a kind of separate project, so it could be updated independently. So probably one, once the full update is out, uh, after that point, it's just typing something like VSL minus uh, uh, update or something like that. So I'm hoping that it will be easy to install. So, uh, okay, anyway, then I will put some work in this and at worst we could add some additional chapter to the install guide how to do that uh, for windows i mean at the moment users can just follow the ubuntu installation guide and the yeah purchasing. yeah the thing is that if you don't know how to install vslg and stuff like that then yeah that's the easy part, <laughs> but first you have to install something like how to install Ubuntu and things like that. On long term, I'm not sure about Microsoft, Microsoft Store requirements regarding licensing and payments and stuff like that, but it would even it would be possible to to distribute or create some kind of uh, 
OMNET distribution and upload it to Microsoft Store. So in that case, it would be really, really easy to install. But I'm not sure about the legal requirements regarding the store. Okay, so we will try okay. this. Um, sorry to interrupt you, Rudolf, but it's about uh, time to start the closure note. I mean, if you still somebody have some notes that you want to share uh, about possible distribution and installation, go ahead. Otherwise, we will move to, to the final part of the summit. Well, okay, I guess uh, we can move to the final part where obviously thank you everybody who participated everybody who presented who had the hackathon thanks to the omnet guys who not only provided help in the hackathon sessions and with their own presentation but also they help with the hackathon itself and for the organization, uh, I would say the, the biggest cheer should go to Giovanni because he handled uh, the bulk part of everything that <coughs> needed to be done. Obviously, thanks to the reviewers because yeah, without them, it wouldn't be possible to kind of get uh, the review, get the, the first feedback. And maybe just... Uh, if you want to share your feedback on the uh, virtual format of the conversations, because we discussed it that it might not have been kind of as interactive as it is when it's uh, really in person, but still, I think it's uh, it's not bad format even for the virtual virtual uh, conference. So if anybody wants to interrupt me, go ahead. Yeah, but it's. Uh, I would say yeah, it's hard because uh, there are no. I mean, for five, with five people, it's quite easy to chat along with uh, around the uh, presentation. It's a bit harder to to do that. I would say it's more something like that we have to use to. For example, if uh, we switch on the video during these uh, sessions, then it's much easier to to start speaking. Uh, it's just a simple thing. So I would say it's it's not so technical. I mean, the problem that there was uh, there was a, a kind of lack of interactivity, but rather we have to especially push ourselves to interact and to to ask people, and also people have to a bit not so shy and just interrupt the so. We have to make this interactive. I don't think it's necessarily because of the format. Yeah, OK, thanks. And I think the part of the, the beauty of uh, conferences are the coffee break, when basically in between the conversations and possibly hackathons, you have a chance to, to meet just uh, uh, on top of a coffee and share uh, information links. and. Uh, so I think that part, uh, that, uh, that's the downside of uh, the virtual conference. Obviously, the positive is that you don't need to spend time to actually travel on the uh, uh, somebody across the world, somebody just uh, across the Europe. But still, the, the traveling yeah. is uh, limited from the equation. But I still think it was a success. We had... Uh, if uh, Giovanni wants to say 12 contributions, if I'm not mistaken. 12 in total, around. we had 11 accepted. Yes, so I think it's more even than last year. So let's hope that uh, the trend will continue towards the next year and we will have 15 submissions and at least 14 accepted. Plus, uh, I was part uh, of uh, two hackathons, at least uh, I was listening there, and that felt uh, really good because uh, 
I had a hackathon last year we have, and the feedback that you get from Levente, Rudolf, or Andras, that is so valuable. The, those few hours or even few minutes that you get the, the direct feedback, you can move your project uh, ahead so much. So that I think that part uh, should stay uh, uh, during the, the summit, as part of the summit, that was uh, really good. And uh, this year we don't have any special prize for the best paper, for the best presentation, but let's hope that it will change next year, that we will meet in person again and somebody will get a nice uh, bottle of wee beer or wine or something. But uh, nevertheless, there are still two hackathon slots, so you can either join there or this uh, main uh, uh, session will be active so you can you can discuss whatever you need and i think andras was trying to say something but you are yes i've got i've got a couple oh, of things okay, to ahead. say yeah first we had a very very important milestone we had a we had our uh, first presentation from an, from another continent uh, uh, a demo from uh, kentaro teremoto jigen thank you very much that that was a pleasure to listen to your presentation and uh, another thing that uh, um, we'd like to upload your uh, presentation slides to the website. So I believe everyone has received an email from Giovanni, uh, which is asking for the slides. Please do it. Please do it right after this meeting so it doesn't get forgotten. If you don't do it today, then you will postpone it to next week and it will get, never get done. So please do it right away. And then we can update the website with the slides. and. Uh, yeah, that'd be kind of useful. We have uploaded all the videos to, to YouTube. The comments, commenting will be open uh, for a few weeks because we had some, some spam comments, <laughs> which we are like, keep on deleting, but um, I don't know. We, I've heard bad things about like this YouTube spam comments, so I don't know how long we're going to to be able to delete them. So after a while, we will probably close the, the comments, but uh, we'll, we'll keep the commenting open at least for a few days or a week. So for example, if you are the presenter of this presentation and, and you have something to add or stuff like that, then you can do that in the comments, comments of the videos for, for a limited time. Yeah, and uh, yeah, of course, thank you everyone for the for being present here and uh, yeah, either meet you in the in the hackathon sessions or we wish you uh, a great weekend. <laughs> yeah, something I would like to add also that while these hackathon sessions were great that these were right now, uh, if you have a project and you have questions that you feel would benefit from discussion with us, and you gathered all your questions then just contact us and we can also arrange some consultation or stuff like that so feel free to 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 contact us and 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 try to extract as much information from us as possible regarding the wandering around along with the coffee in your hand uh, yeah i feel that 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 is missing some gossiping and stuff like that uh i'm still looking how to replicate that in virtual space we still like that also between the i mean uh, between us core developers so let's hope that somebody will figure out some great uh replacement for that too <laughs> i don't know what that will be probably a virtual reality tour or something like that. <clears throat> Thank you guys from my side also. Thank you. Thank you all just, also from uh, my side. And uh, sorry, I, I, I don't know who are speaking. I, ju I just want to thank also Marcel and Vladimir because yeah, Marcel just thanked me. So I, I like to, 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 to thank them as well. And to thank Asanga for his, his good work for the hackathon. And of course, all the core team.
Yes, yes, of course. I forgot Asanga. Ah, I'm very sorry. Uh, the man behind the hackathon. So obviously, yeah, he's uh, he is deserved for our thanks uh, as well. And uh, just a note for the technical part: uh, if in case we would have to uh, have it uh, virtual again, uh, I think it's nice for uh, Zoom that your kind of chat history jumps with you. But uh, I would, I think it's better like you started separate uh, threads on Discord that you can jump in the hackathon and you see already there is some discussion there and you can yeah. kind of join in because if you do that on Zoom, you completely missed uh, whatever you were discussing yeah. or sharing links in there. And because it preserved the history there, so it's better that you can kind of go back to the hackathon that you missed and just read the links at least or some notes from there. Yeah, so thank you, Rudolf, for setting up the Discord and managing the rooms. That was really helpful. Technically, we could do this on Discord because we were never more than 50 uh, at the same time on the same view, but we didn't know in advance. So Zoom was also OK, I guess. And so I would also like to thank uh, the, all the participants uh, for the summit as well as the hackathons and uh, uh, the organizing committee, the rest of the guys for uh, the, the cooperation we had in, in organizing, coordinating, and the, the core team for spending their valuable time. It was very helpful. Uh, uh, for, this is what I heard from all the hackathons, like uh, people, some of the people who I talked to had uh, really benefited from the hackathon. So thanks a lot. Thank you all.